Yes, we are live. Thank hello, you. hello everyone. This is uh, Dr. Shell Watts of mbaatmet.com. Welcome to today's webinar hosted by the GMAT Club. I'm happy to be here today. Today we are going to be talking about uh, the most prestigious EMBA programs outside the USA. We're gonna give you a high level look to get you a sense of what is being offered today and how to start to think about um, how to choose a program and how to decide, is it one of the top programs? Before we get started, I uh, just wanna give you a little bit of information about our business. Uh, MBA Admit has been offering admissions advising for over 30 years. Our company has worked with all the top programs, both EMBA, and full-time, and we have great success with all those programs. Here's just a, a partial list of the schools that we work with often. And we welcome you to come to our website after the webinar. If you would want us to uh, do a profile evaluation and let you know what we think about the strength of your candidacy and how you might fare if applying to some of these top EMBA programs. So let's start from the beginning. Uh, what is an EMBA? Now, EMBA is an abbreviated name for Executive Master of Business Administration. And so the EMBA programs are designed and they target, um, designed for and they target older candidates who have more experience than you would see typically for a full-time MBA student. So while a typical full-time student at the MBA level would have two to five years of post-college work experience, the typical EMBA e student would have uh, five to seven or more years of post-college work experience. You do not need to be a director or the, in, in the C-suite to qualify for an EMBA program. Some of them do target younger candidates, so people in their late 20s and 30s. Other programs do prefer people in their 40s or 50s. And so you should get acquainted with each of those programs and understand what is their preference. But one of the great attractions for the executive MBA is that students do not need to stop working or relocate to, uh, to complete the program. They often meet on weekends or one full week once a month. And so students can carve um, time either on weekends or arrange with their work to take off a week and work remotely so that they can complete the program. And it, it becomes a great option to advance yourself educationally. Just remember that the EMBA is simply the route to the MBA degree. Your degree will say MBA and not EMBA. So um, you become an MBA graduate of the school. And so why would people attend an EMBA program outside the USA, regardless of citizenship? Um, for people who are in Europe, of course, it, it's going to be more local to them. For Americans, um, they may want to expand their international reach. And so, and also for candidates in other parts of the world, say the developing countries, um, they also might want to expand an international reach. And so the traditional reasons for seeking an EMBA apply. So to secure a pedigree or credentialing that you feel you're missing or might benefit from, you, you get the brand of the school, you, you benefit from the prestige of the school. It also gives you the opportunity to acquire skills that you might want and need for promotion or advancement. And it also allows you to grow your professional network. But specifically for these programs that are more international or based in an a country outside the USA, it'll give you an opportunity to, to expand your access to people and resources internationally. It gives you the opportunity to access resources in another country. It also allows you to study in a truly global cohort because the cohort typically is going to have um, more international participants than many of the programs might in the USA. And then again, um, it allows you to learn in an environment that stresses global topics or global perspectives. And so, Again, there's many reasons why you might want to choose a school based in Europe or Asia as opposed to the USA because of these particular benefits. So then the question is, which top business schools offer EMBA programs outside the USA? Um, if you look at the top business schools outside the USA, so whether, whether Europe or, or Asia, um, you will see that most of them do offer an executive MBA. And so here's just a sampling of some of those schools, London Business School, INSEAD, Oxford, IE, Schulich, University of Hong Kong. And so um, they will, many of them are going to offer their own programs. Many US schools also offer um, programs abroad, either 
in their own campuses in other countries or in a, an alliance with a school located in a different country. And so that brings us to the whole matter of diversity. So um, there are different ways that these programs are structured. Some are um, based at one school in its home country. So for example, London Business School and Oxford, they each op offer their own program in England. Some of them are dual or triple degree programs from business schools that are working in alliance and are, are meeting at, in different countries. So for instance, the Columbia EMBA Global Americas in Europe, they work with London Business School. At the end of the program, you will have two degrees, to, so two separate MBAs, one from Columbia and one from LBS. Um, and you will, during the program, be sometimes having your class in New York and sometimes having it in London. Um, there's many programs like that. There's also Kellogg Schulich. Um, and so it's nice to have the option to, you know, do a dual degree or a triple degree um, and then have the opportunity to also be schooled in different countries. And then there's also a single school that is offering a program in a country other than its home country. So it simply has a campus located in a different country. And so an example of that is Booth in London and INSEAD in San Francisco also INSEAD in Singapore. So um, you can take a look at the diversity of all these programs because uh, the offerings are magnificent and, and many more in number than even 10 years ago. So how do you choose? One of the first big things is gonna be time and location because not everybody can structure their work to be available for a full week once a month. And so, if you don't have that flexibility, you should be, of course, not looking at those type of programs. And so the Columbia uh, EMBA Global will, re will require that you take a whole week once a month and be able to be in attendance. Uh, if that is not something that you can do, then you'd be looking at some of the other programs. Some of the other programs will meet only on weekends. Sometimes it'll be every weekend, sometimes once, twice, or three times a month on the weekend. How do you determine which are the most prestigious or the top 10? Uh, the first thing to think about is, of course, formal rankings, and then there's also informal rankings. Formal rankings, there are various organizations that will um, rank the programs. Um, sometimes it's, uh, it's usually a list that will be all EMBA programs around the world and not just specifically those outside the USA. And so you can basically funnel out the ones that are outside the USA and see how they are being ranked. The two, two of these organizations that people often cite are The Economist and Financial Times. And here's a sampling, this is coming from The Economist for 2020. And you'll see uh, that this is a subset of a broader list that would include US, some of the US schools. And these are the ones outside the USA. And this is how this particular organization has ranked some of them. Now, one thing that may jump out at you as you look at this is you might be surprised at how they're being ranked. You would expect that you'd see NCAT on this list. You might expect that you would see London Business School as well. And so that brings us to a downside of the formal ranking, which is methodology variances. Uh, these organizations may be weighing something more than you would. So for instance, you may think that they should weigh the student's experience, the quality, what, what they think of the program more heavily than they do, or they should be weighing perhaps how employers view the programs more. And so there's gonna be differences in methodology, which means that the list look nothing alike in terms of where our school's actually being placed. Another thing is that one might argue that these lists don't correlate well with real world prestige. And so, like I said, London Business School and INSEAD should be um, on that list in most people's minds. Actually, I do believe that Oxford was on that list. Um, but basically, we would expect to see these schools ranked very well and they don't appear, which means that the methodology is just sort of doing something differently than maybe a, a typical person might when they're looking at the school and deciding how attractive it is. There's also the issue of yearly swings that because of the methodology, sometimes the school might be ranked quite high one year and then fall dramatically the next year. And you have to remember that no one's gonna remember what the rankings were 10 years from now. And so if you're looking at the list and saying, look, it's ranked number two, why don't I go for that school? Um, 10 years from now, it may be ranked 22 and no one's gonna remember it was ranked two. That's not how they're using, that's not how they're valuing the school. And so you need to think about other things such as 
the long-term reputation of the school, the long-term prestige of the school, the strength of the alumni, and those should be factoring into what you're thinking in terms of, is this a prestigious school? So that brings us to the issue of informal rankings. And so when I do say informal rankings, what I mean is the, the long-standing reputation and prestige of the school. Um, you see this even at the undergraduate level. So for instance, Harvard will be considered by most people the top school in the USA. And some years it'll be ranked number one, sometimes it'll be ranked number three. Most people will make the decision to go there based on the long-term reputation, not on a ranking that might fluctuate year to year. And so the same thing applies for the EMBA. Think about the overall prestige of the school. Also think about beyond the current curriculum, because current curriculum is very important. It's gonna tell you, will you get the skills that you need? But remember that you're getting a brand and the brand is what is long-term. And so you need to consider that the, the, the current curriculum is more of the short-term consideration. The brand is a long-term uh, consideration and you need to consider both when you're thinking about, is this a pre prestigious school and a school that I should target? Other things that you should consider, what we call parts of the return on investment are these factors. Um, again, what's, what are the skills and knowledge you'll be able to pick up during the program? How will, will it impact your salary? Will it position you for a promotion? How great is the alumni network? And um, is it strong enough for your needs? And do you have access to career services should you want to change jobs or careers? This is a deeper look at one of these um, factors, what we call the return on investment factor, um, increase in salary. And so there are organizations that try to project um, what will be the impact on your salary. And according to this one study, um, a typical EMBA graduate will enjoy a 14.1% increase in, in compensation. Um, others say 60% when you're going a little bit further out in time to assess the difference in, in the income. So impact on salary can be quite attractive and each of the schools can, there, there are organizations like um, this particular study that will, uh, or rather survey that will show for each individual business school, what is the impact. And so you can look that up and look for the school that you are assessing to see what the impact seems to be on salary. And then there's also promotion that um, students are reporting that when they go into these programs that they get promoted during the program sometimes and after the program. So a big, a big bounce on the career. We did a longer a webinar specifically on return on investment. So if you're more interested in going in depth about that, look up this webinar um, hosted by GMAT Club. You can either do it through, locate it through a YouTube search or the link is actually listed here as well. And so when you consider all of these factors, um, the formal, the informal, the return on investment factors, um, in many people's views, some of the top schools will be these on this list. So London Business School, INSEAD, Columbia's two programs um, with Americas in Europe, the separate one being Asia, um, Oxford, IESE, HEC, IE, Kellogg Schulich, and Booth. I think many people would say that these are some of the top schools um, in terms of offering programs outside the USA. And, and this is growing. The, the wonderful thing to see about the EMBA field is that um, people are recognizing, the schools are recognizing around the world the value of the EMBA and the desire for it. And so more and more schools are bringing out their programs. And so this selection will probably only get more extensive uh, moving forward. So feel free to contact us, especially if you're looking for a profile evaluation. We are more than happy to, to assess your profile, let you know what we think about um, your profile with regard to competitiveness for these schools. And this is how you can contact us. Um, I'm going to be taking some questions and answers now. And so I'm going to shift off here and um, start to reply to some of the questions that should be coming through. All right, so I'm trying to look for some of these questions, which I believe are gonna start to appear. And I'm going to actually ask 
for, let's see. All right, I see quite a number of them here. Um, let's take a look. Okay, I'm gonna start with this one at the very bottom uh, that I'm seeing on my screen, which is, are there full-time EMBA programs? That is a very good question. People um, are always asking this because sometimes people want to simply stop working. Other times people actually see it as an opportunity to try to get to a different country and maybe then be able to stay by landing a job or so forth. There are actually not a lot of full-time EMBA programs and they may not even be labeled EMBA, but there are some programs that are MBAs targeted for older candidates that are full-time. Some of the ones that I know about would be um, MIT Sloan Fellows. There's also Stanford has something called MSX, which stands for Masters in Science. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't have the MBA la label, but it is essentially their executive MBA. It's a one-year program full-time. The MIT Sloan Fellows is also one-year full-time. Um, there's also programs offered at Kellogg full-time. Um, and Cornell full-time, and all of those are in the USA. So that doesn't, for those of you looking for something outside the USA, um, that doesn't satisfy that. Um, for most of the ones outside the USA, I believe most of them are part-time. And so it is very, it's actually hard at this point to locate full-time EMBA programs or full-time programs geared to older candidates. I suspect that you're gonna see more over time because there is a demand that's not being met at this point for that. Um, so another question, does a poor undergraduate record prevent admission at one of these top schools? Well, this is the same answer I would give for EMBA programs inside the USA. So it, it holds for both those inside the USA and those outside, which is um, at the stage at which you're typically applying for the executive MBA, um, you are at least 10 years removed from your undergraduate record. Sometimes you're closer to it, but essentially the further away you are from it, the less defined you are, the less relevant it is. And so imagine that you, you know, you're 10 years out, um, you've had 10 years of work experience at this stage, you should be defined by the successes you've had. And so the key thing is to redirect the attention in your application and your essays and the recommendations to all the successes you've had professionally. Um, sometimes if the record is really bad, you need to demonstrate to the school that you have the skills you need to get through the program. That can be done by taking um, courses online and getting A's and having what we call an alternative transcript. Sometimes you can be doing that by um, just doing very well on a standardized test like the ex executive assessment. Um, but in general, you know, the poor undergraduate record should not stand in the way if you create a strategy that allows you to redirect the attention and also demonstrate that you have the needed skills for success. All right, so let's take a look at another one. Do non-US EMBA programs have age preferences? Um, I would say yes, and so you should know the preferences of each of those schools. One way to figure that out is to go to the websites and take a look at the class profiles that, that often will give you a sense of things. When the average age for matriculating students is 40, 43, that tells you that they do really like older students. There's, there's gonna be quite a number of people in their 40s and their 50s, as well as some people in the 30s. When the average matriculating age is, is 35 or 34, that tells you that the school is very open to younger candidates. And so you should take a look and um, see exactly what the school is doing in terms of you know, what that age average and what the average years of work experience is. Okay, I'm just looking for Another a question here. Um, okay, so I'm gonna answer this one. Can engineers fare well in admissions to EMBA programs outside the USA? And um, what is the minimum title they should have? Um, I think that th this, is a, uh, this is gonna vary. Okay, so I think that schools that are a little bit newer into the EMBA field will probably be more open to engineers. And so, consider that when you're you know, applying. 
For those that are more established, um, I think that the schools over time tend to want candidates that have moved somewhat out of the pure sort of technical arena to be more managing at, at a business type level within maybe a technology space. And that would imply that your title needs to be more than project leader, more at the program leader level, if not higher. And so you need to look really well and try to understand where each of the school is with that, because I do think a lot of we weeding out happens at this point as schools like London Business School and Oxford, they're going to be more skeptical about someone who looks too technical and they're going to want someone who is more at a senior level in terms of um, overseeing maybe engineering and not being at a lower level like a project leader. So um, you have to be careful because a lot of engineers do apply to business school. And so you want to target the school well and also present a very business relevant application. Okay, I see a question about, is sponsorship a must to pursue an EMBA? Um, no, an answer, a quick, quick, quick answer is no, because um, not all companies offer that. So you will not be penalized if your company doesn't offer it. Um, it obviously, if a, if a company has an established program and they maybe send for two students a year to a particular school, that's a major endorsement of a candidate. So it can, it can seriously help a candidate. It communicates to the school how much that candidate is valued, but the absence of that funding is not gonna close the door. And so, um, so the quick answer to that is no, it would not help hurt you. It's not a must. Um, there's a question here about whether employers are skeptical of programs that offer two degrees, you know, are, are those degrees watered down? So for instance, Columbia with London Business School and the EMBA Global Americas program, you get a separate degree from each of the schools in the same amount of time that you typically would only earn one degree from a different school. So you'll have both a Columbia Business School MBA and a London Business School MBA. And um, to my experience, absolutely not. Uh, the, it's a wonderful program. Everyone I know that has gone there has absolutely loved it. And um, these are extremely prestigious schools. So you can only imagine what it looks like on a resume and how impressive it is to employers when they see that. So I absolutely do not think there's any skepticism. And I think that it's actually a very great um, program that allows you a wonderful, diverse education in two different countries and, and gives you an amazing alumni network. So those are certainly programs you should look at. There's a question about what is the age group and average GMAT score for one year residential MBA programs? Um, and so I'm assuming that the person means at the, at the executive type level. And I would be saying, um, I'm going to use two in particular. Again, these are in the USA, so it's not ideal for people who are wanting something outside the USA. Um, those two programs, the Stanford MSX and the MIT Sloan, they're very receptive to younger candidates. So someone in the late 20s, they're also receptive to someone in the 40s. And so there's a big diversity. Um, and your your task in your application is to make yourself look very unique because those are small programs. And so every person that they place in there is very important to the overall program. Um, INSEAD at the full-time level is actually open to older candidates. So even though it's not te technically an EMBA program, when I get a candidate who's in their mid thirties or even late thirties, I still think they might have a shot at INSEAD because unlike most other full-time programs, um, they don't sort of cap it at a certain age range. Many full-time programs will say at 32, you're just too old to be in a full-time program, but INSEAD doesn't have such a hard number. So for those of you looking for something in uh, Europe, that might be something you explore. Okay, I'm looking, I've got to read through some of these questions. So sorry for the pause. All right, so let's see. Um, do the EMBA programs that are outside the USA have a good representation of candidates from developing countries? Um, yes, and so um, that is a great benefit of it. Um, you know, in the USA, the representation of people from developing countries 
usually is dependent on is the person already working in the area. So basically, um, you know, if it's someone from India who's a foreign national, usually the only way you can attend in the USA is if you're actually working already in the USA because of the mechanics of getting to the school, you know, once a week or once a month. And so the same holds true for some of these programs, but it's a whole lot easier to um, fly from India to Europe um, than it is usually from India to the USA. And so the, some of those programs will get people who are still resident in their country who just fly in. Um, and one of the reasons you're starting to see programs in East Asia, of course, is that they're catering to people who live in the East Asia region and it's also, again, easier for some people in other countries, other regions to fly into Europe from, I'm sorry, to fly into Asia than it is um, to get all the way to the USA. So I do think they have actually good representation of um, people. And it's not only um, people resident in the developing country, it's also people who are foreign nationals working in countries companies that are in those the area of, of the school. So they'll have both. And so I do think they do have a, a, a pretty respectable representation. Um, let's see. I think I'll take about two more questions. Um, There's a question about U.S. citizens and um, are they at an advantage if they apply to EMBA programs outside the USA? Um, I would actually say yes. And the only reason the rationale is simply that in that pool, they will be underrepresented. So basically, um, for a school that is um, even inside EMBA, um, most Amer Americans would be looking at American schools. And so because they're here. And so the student who goes into the American who goes into the NCAD EMBA is working usually in the area. And so there's gonna be fewer people in that situation and then targeting that school. And so as an underrepresented minority, you will have a better chance at admission. So I would tend to say yes, that um, US citizens would have an advantage um, applying to those programs relative to if they're applying to programs in the USA. And I will take one last question here. Uh, a quick response to this one about what is the financial cost for the EMBA in Europe? E e that information is definitely available on every single school's website. So go take a look at that. And um, let's see what else here. Okay, so there's one last question. This, this will be the last one I take, which is how effective is an EMBA versus an MBA if one is looking to change geography post-graduation? Um, in many ways, this question, um, if, if you're an executive level age, so basically if you're in your mid thirties and higher, you for the most part will not have access to full-time MBA programs at many schools because they will think that you're too old, that you have too much experience. And so it's kind of a false option. You, you just may not have access to a full-time MBA. Remember that the EMBA is just a route. You're still getting an MBA. Um, and so if you want that training in your mid thirties and higher, usually the EMBA is going to be going to be the most viable option. And so, um, with that in mind, given the fact that most of them are not full-time residential, um, you will have to work harder if you're going to be trying to use it to make a, a, a career change or a geographical change. But it's possible people do it. You just have to take the initiative. You need to take advantage of all the careers, you know, resources that are available at the school. Um, and then you can try to make that change. But the best case scenario many people believe is to get into a residential program because then you get to the the other country and while you're there, you're networking and trying to land a job um, locally. But the unfortunate thing is that there are not that many that are residential and targeting an older candidate. So uh, just do your homework about that. I do suspect that over time that will change. As I said, I do believe it's a market that is not being served well right now and that schools will start to recognize that and kick in some programs. All right, well, listen, we do welcome you to come to our website and uh, feel free to get a profile evaluation and um, 
thank you for joining us today uh, and good luck in your quest for education at the MBA, through the MBA. All right, thanks for being here today. Take care.